Galatians chapter 5. PJ read the whole chapter for us as we were getting started tonight. I want to just read one part that we're going to focus on because I, I really I want us to hear it together so that we can walk through it bit by bit. Starting in verse 16, Paul says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Praise God. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Would you bow your heads with me one more time? Holy Spirit, thank you. Thank you for living in us. Thank you for breathing the word for us. And so I just ask tonight, Holy Spirit, teach us your word. The same manner that you anointed the men to write it, anoint us to hear it, to read it, to believe it, and most of all, to obey it. Have your way in our lives tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So this is our sixth week in this Life in the Spirit series. And the kind of familiar refrain, sort of I guess the baseline for the whole thing has been this. We believe, we trust according to the scripture that the Holy Spirit lives in us. The battle, the struggle, maybe the problem is for us to live in the Holy Spirit. He's in me, but there's too many times in my life where I am not in him. And so the battle is to yield and submit, to follow the Holy Spirit into all truth by making no room for the flesh. Now, we're not going to go into it deeply, but the book of Galatians is an interesting letter because the letter is being written to a group of Gentile believers that were being influenced by a group of legalistic Jewish believers, and some would even question if they actually were believers, into thinking that salvation was only available to the Gentiles if they kept the law, and specifically the law of circumcision. So the whole letter of Galatians is Paul writing to refute that. He's writing to correct and even to rebuke the Galatians for even considering such a thing. And so in this letter, he writes to them about faith and the law, about freedom and bondage, about Gentiles and Jews. And then as he gets near the end of the letter, Paul seems to say that the entire argument is about the flesh and the spirit. That it all hinges on this. It all comes down to this. It, to me, it's almost similar to when Jesus said, all the law and the prophets hang on this. He's saying now, all of this argument, all of this battle, all of this struggle, all of your ups and your downs, your ins and your outs, all of it comes down to this, the flesh and the spirit. So in verse 16, he just gives a command, but I say, walk by the spirit. There's two things we're going to wrestle with tonight. Number one, what does that mean? And then number two, what does it look like? Like once we know what it means, then do we have an example because a lot of things, we know the answer, we just don't know how to act it out, right? We know what it says, and we know what it means, but then when we say, but how do I do it? How do I apply it? What would it look like for me to actually walk by the Spirit? We have to have an example. First, what does it mean? This is actually kind of easy. The Greek word is that we translate as walk in verse 16, it simply means to tread all around. It is a picture of life. So basically, Paul is saying, live in the Spirit. 
Live in the Spirit. That means that it is an opportunity. It's a reality. Because God doesn't ask us, the, the Scripture does not command us to do anything that is impossible for us to do. So when he says, live in the Spirit, what he's saying is, I'm giving you everything you need to live in the Spirit. Aren't there a lot of times we say we can't just because we don't want to? Aren't there a lot of times, and I'm not just talking about living in the Spirit, I'm just talking about life in general. Aren't there a lot of times where we say we can't because we don't want to do what's required? That, you know, I, I can remember when I used to work with my dad, and, and, I, and I use that term work loosely. So, you, you know, my, my dad was that guy that when he was working on something, my job basically was to hold the flashlight, and I better hold it still, and then to go get whatever he didn't bring with him the first time around. The, the only problem was I didn't know what anything was, and he didn't really know the name of anything, or at least he didn't know it in the moment. So he'd say, go get me that, um, that, um, that, um, you know what I'm talking about. And so it would be me in a panic going to the garage, just basically opening the drawers going, dear God, please let me find what this is because I don't even know what I'm looking for. But anyway, when my dad would work on something, we'd inevitably get to a point where it was stuck. It wasn't working. It's what, you know, we weren't going to be able to fix it the way that he had said. And so in my head, I always thought, well, we gave it a good try. You, you know, that looks like we can't do it. And my dad would inevitably say, Lord, show me how to do this. And then we try something else. And then we try something else. And then we try something else. We may spend a whole day trying to do that thing that I thought we should have given up on hours ago. Don't a lot of us live our lives as soon as there's opposition, we go, I guess we're not supposed to do that. I guess it wasn't meant to be. I guess, I guess we should leave this for somebody else. And so when Paul says, walk by the Spirit, I think there's a lot of us that in our lives have said, I don't really, well, I tried. I don't really know what that means. I, I think that's for somebody else. And yet it is a command for all of us that if the Spirit is in us, it is for us to be in the Spirit. So what does it look like to walk in the Spirit? Over these last few weeks, we've talked about believing that the Spirit lives in us. That's a big part of this. We've talked about obeying the leadership of the Holy Spirit by being obedient to the Word of God. We've talked about the Spirit giving life, but the flesh being of no use at all. But again, what does it look like? Because I think most of us live our lives and then we ask God for help when we don't know what to do. I think most of us just go about doing what we want or what we think is right, and then we ask God for guidance when we have a big decision or for rescue when we're in big trouble. But that can't be what it is to live in the Spirit, because living in the Spirit is a, is a picture of something that happens constantly. Rescuing us from ourselves is something we ask Him to do occasionally. But I'll just ask without being judgmental, which one looks more like your life so far? The continual step-by-step -step walk or the occasional calling out and pleading for help? Because I hate to admit it, I'm way closer to the asking for help than I am the continual walking with him. That can't be what it looks like to live by the Spirit. And so I think we have to start with this. Living by the Spirit is about surrender and submission. The beginning of it is laying ourselves down. It's acknowledging that I need you, not in this moment. I need you every moment. That I need your direction. I need your wisdom. I need your grace. I need your mercy. I don't just need your help. I need you. And I think too often, we're waiting for the Spirit to help when He's offering Himself. And there's a big difference. Because here's what happens. When I need your help, once you have helped me, I'm done with you. I thank you, or I pay you, or I hug you, but then I go back to doing what I was doing. Living in the Spirit is not asking for help. It's getting Him and understanding I need Him even more than I need myself. It starts with submission and surrender. It is, as Jesus described it, denying ourselves, taking up the cross daily, and following Him. Living in the Spirit is, being, is what it really means to be born again. It's what it really means to be born from above. It's not where we go, it's who comes to live in us, as we've talked about so often in these last few weeks. So if we ask one more time, what's it look like? I think ultimately it looks like Jesus. 
In Matthew chapter 4 and Mark chapter 1, when Jesus was baptized, it tells us that the Holy Spirit came and rested on him in the form of a dove. And then both passages say that the very next thing that happened, that as soon as the Spirit came to dwell on Jesus, that the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. Now, I wonder if the Holy Spirit told Jesus every detail as he was leading him. And I know some of us will argue, and, and, and William, our, our, our men's Bible study that we've been a part of for a few years, we somehow end up back into the debate over and over again. Was Jesus able not to sin, or was Jesus just not able to sin? Semantics that are, to be real honest, a waste of time most of the time. So the question we sometimes have is, well, if Jesus is God and he knows all things, then how was he actually being led? He can't be tempted on every count as we are unless he had to yield, obey, and trust as we do. And so personally, I believe that while he knew all things, he limited his knowledge to teach us how to follow. Because if he didn't, then we can't say, you understand. He doesn't. So if you struggle with that, I'm okay. Keep asking God about it. But give me a little bit of leeway tonight. I think ultimately, this is how we want the Spirit to lead us. Right, We want the Spirit to lead us the way that we think he led Jesus. We want all the information up front. We want to know the plan, how long it will take, which way we go, who will be there, how much it will cost, and what the outcome is going to be. But I don't believe that's how Jesus was led at all. And I don't believe that's how Jesus followed at all. I believe that he went step by step and moment by moment that he was led by the Spirit. Because it wouldn't write it that way if it wasn't. It would just be Jesus going about. But it says the Spirit, Mark says it this way, the Spirit drove him to the wilderness to be tempted. Jesus endured the cross and despised the shame. He accomplished the purpose for which the Father sent him because he was led by the Spirit moment by moment and day by day. Not just from miracle to miracle or big decision to big decision. He followed the Spirit and he trusted the Father. We talk about this often, but I think the implications are enormous and needs to be talked about often. Jesus said in John 5, 19, I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing of Himself, only what He sees the Father doing. So that doesn't mean that Jesus didn't have the power to do anything. He was and is the image of the invisible God. He had then and has now the name that is above every other name. He had been given all authority under heaven and earth. He is the one by whom, through whom, and for whom all things were created. Jesus had all the power to do anything he desired at any time, but he chose to watch the Father. And he chose to follow the leadership of the Spirit. And he chose to do the will of the one who sent him. He says it over and over again in Scripture. I have not come to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. He yielded, he submitted, we could even say he surrendered his authority to the Father to teach us how to follow the Spirit. To teach us how to trust the character of God to teach us what it means to walk in the Spirit. Living in the Spirit, I think, looks more like Jesus than it looks like anything else. It's constantly choosing to trust God, constantly choosing to obey God, to listen to and follow the Holy Spirit. If we don't learn how to be led by the Spirit in all things, we will never be ready for what we might call the big things. Right? If I can't obey the Spirit in the way that I speak to my wife daily, how do I think I'm going to obey the Spirit when I stand up here and try to share the Word of God with you or somewhere else? If I can't obey the Spirit in the way that I take care of my body, why do I think I'm going to be able to obey the Spirit in the way that I take care of the body of Christ? All of these things have to matter to us where we realize if I'm unwilling to follow Him moment by moment, I won't be ready to follow Him when the moments become larger. And a lot of us wonder, why is this hard when big things come? Because I haven't submitted to small things. One of Amanda's favorite verses, Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 5. 
It says, if you have raced with men on foot and they have wearied you, how will you compete with horses? If we are unwilling to submit our thoughts and our actions, our days and our moments to God, how do we think we're going to somehow submit our lives to God? If we're unwilling and unable to follow the Spirit in the things we think are small, why do we think we're going to be able to submit to Him in the things that He calls large? And so Paul wrote, but I say, walk in the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Real, real quickly, I don't want to get off base here tonight, but real quickly, notice the way that it's written. It says, but I say, walk in the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. I think most of us have believed this backwards, that somehow we need to not walk by the desires of the flesh, and that will free us to walk in the Spirit. But what Paul is saying is, if you choose the Spirit, the flesh will fall away. If you choose to listen, to obey, if you desire to walk in the Spirit, the desires of the flesh will get smaller and smaller and smaller. It's not our effort not to sin. It's our desire to walk with God that then limits the power of sin in our lives. It's not about our works. It's about our submission. It's about our hearts trusting him enough to yield. The flesh is simple. It's every part of us that's not yet fully yielded to God. Everything that hasn't yet been transformed and fully sanctified. And here's the truth. We all have flesh. And we will all have flesh until we see Jesus. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 affirms that we are right now the children of God. But then it says that when Jesus appears, we will be like him. That means we're all in process, right? We're in process. The interesting thing, the, the beautiful thing, is that the kingdom of God is not an either-or kingdom, but it is a kingdom, it is a both-and kingdom. So the kingdom of God speaks of where we are now, but it also speaks of where how God sees us, how God views us, and where God will bring us. So that means we are saved, and we're being saved. It means that we are sanctified, and we are being sanctified. It means that we are transformed and we are being transformed. It means we are his workmanship and yet he is still working on us. We are and we will be. And so when we start talking about the ING of it all, it doesn't mean it hasn't been accomplished. It means that it's still being finished. It means that what is done in the spirit is done, but it is it is coming along, right? Because the physical always comes after the spiritual. And so God says, you are mine. And then he says, and now I'm going to make you mine. God says, you belong to me. And now I'm going to gather you to myself. God says, you are saved. And now I'm going to go to work saving you. I think some of this is important because I think we get nervous with the ING of it all. We get nervous with the participle. I'm being saved. Does that mean I'm not yet? I'm being transformed. Does that mean I'm not yet? No, it means that in the eyes of God, you are, but your body is taking a little while to catch up. Or your mind, or your spirit, and for most of us, our lives. I believe that it's important to touch on this a little bit. I believe in eternal security. I believe that if we are in Christ, then we will never be removed from Christ. You have heard me say this many times. Salvation is as strong as God's love, not as weak as our faith. Yes, we must believe, but we are kept by the power of God through faith, 1 Peter 1.5 tells us. Notice, it doesn't say that we're kept by the power of our faith. It says that we are kept by the power of God through our faith. But I think it's also important to add that salvation, while free, is not easy. I don't believe that salvation is as simple as repeating after me or as wanting to go to heaven when we die or not wanting to go to hell. Re salvation requires submission. It requires surrender. It requires repentance. It requires that we follow Jesus. If you want to know salvation, I don't want to say how hard it is, but how supernatural it is, how divine it is, how miraculous it is, join us these next few days in the last few days in the book of Numbers reading plan. And you'll see Balaam, the father of false prophets, with God filling his mouth with his word, him meeting God, actually coming face to face with God, the spirit of God coming upon him, and still somehow he yields to his flesh rather than the Spirit of God. So I'm not saying salvation is hard. I am saying salvation is miraculous. It's 
It's not as simple as checking a box. It is having our desire turn toward Jesus. This is why in Acts and all the letters of the New Testament that follow Acts, the preaching of the gospel was the preaching of Jesus. Because again, there is no other name by which men can be saved. Salvation is redemption, it's reconciliation, it's restoration with God, and that is only done through a relationship with Jesus. It's only done through confessing that He is Lord, and not just Lord generically, or even Lord of all things. He is the Lord of my life. He is the Lord of my heart. He is the Lord of my decisions. And then believing with all of our heart that God raised Him from the dead. Salvation is not being sorry for our sin, but that's what it will lead to. And salvation is not being afraid of hell. It's not even being hopeful for heaven. Salvation is believing in and submitting to and loving Jesus. And when we are saved by grace, not of works, we are always saved. And I don't want to get, again, too far on this, what some might sound what might sound to some like a tangent, but I do believe this is important because there is a difference between hearing, knowing, receiving, and believing. Belief leads to action. We live according to what we believe. As Henry Blackaby wrote in Experiencing God, if you want to know what someone believes, watch how they live. If you want to know what you believe, watch how you live. Because a lot of us say, I believe, I believe, I believe in a whole bunch of stuff. But then if you really start looking at our lives, we start, you have to start questioning, do I really believe any of this? And here's the really dangerous, I can believe for you until it touches me. I believe you should get over it until I have to go through it. Right? Haven't you ever seen somebody go through something and you think, I, I don't think I would handle it like that until you actually have to experience it? The easiest example of this is everybody, everybody knows how to parent until they are parents. Every single one of us, before we had kids, watched other people and said, I would never do, let my kids do that. That is not how I'm going to handle it. And then when you have kids, you're just trying to survive. That's all, that's all you want to do is just survive. You want them to live and you want to live through it. Like you start wondering, will they make it? And then there's a point where you go, will I make it? Like, will I still be here once they're, once they're grown and on their own? Will I have anything left at all? And you realize, forgive me, Lord, I knew not of whence I spoke. We've all got that stuff in our lives that we think we believe until it gets tested. And isn't that the reason for the tests? Because we would go through life thinking we believe things that we don't actually believe. And so often tests of faith, trouble, difficulty, trials that we did not expect, they come along. Not because God's angry with us, but because God loves us. And God wants, to, wants us to know those things you think you're sure of, let's see. And never forget, He already knows. We need to see. We need to know. Because generally we need to yield. We need to submit and surrender even further. See, belief doesn't just inform, it transforms. It changes us. Have you ever noticed that in Jesus' explanation of the parable of the sower or the parable of the soils, depending on which Bible, which version you read, how they, how they uh, title it, in Matthew chapter 13, it, Jesus says that the rocky ground and the thorny ground represent people who, quote unquote, receive the word, but then the word is pushed or choked out. He did not say that these were people who believed the word, but that received it. See, it's not a picture of people who lost their faith or lost their salvation, but people who never came to that place. It's the rich young ruler who knew that Jesus was at the very least a prophet, who wanted the assurance of eternal life, but lacked the faith, lacked the belief to sell all that he had and follow Jesus. It's the disciples that we've been talking about in John chapter 6 that were fed by Jesus. They were ready to make Jesus their king. They were following him. But when he said hard things that they didn't understand, they turned away because they had never surrendered or submitted to him. As Jesus himself said, they only followed him for their stomach's sake. To have him fulfill their desires, not because he had become the desire of their hearts. And all of us have followed Jesus at that level at some point. And there are probably parts of our lives that we're still following Jesus at that level. Right? And that's not questioning salvation. That's actually acknowledging that there's maturity that still needs to be built in all of us. I've told many people many times, myself included, we're all immature in something. Because all maturity means is complete. 
That's in, in Scripture, in the King James Version, it's perfect. The, the Greek just means complete lacking nothing. So until you can say, I'm not lacking anything anywhere, there's immaturity. There's places of immaturity that offend some of us, which is an immaturity in and of itself. But God is working in all of us to get us to the point where we're not following him for our stomach's sake. Where we're not following him so that we can get a job or get healed or get a husband or get a wife or, or get this or get that. That we're just following him because I've seen him and there's nothing else like him. There's nothing else that compares to him. As Peter said, you have the words of eternal life. Where else would we go? And there are places in our lives that we have gotten to that point, And then there are places in our lives that we have not. And so he tests those places. He squeezes those places. He graciously yields us or leads us through those places so that we can yield the parts that we've continued to hold for ourselves. I think that this is the people that are described in 1 John 2.19 where it says they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would, not have, they would have continued with us. See, salvation requires surrender, it requires submission, and it leads to transformation. The grace that saves us will change us, but we have to yield to the Spirit at work in us. This process of transformation, of sanctification, is largely what it looks like to live in the Spirit. Think of the things that Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would do in John 14 and 16. He said, He will bear witness of Me. He will teach you all things. He will bring to your remembrance all the words that I have spoken. He will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. He will guide you into all truth. And He will listen and speak the things that He hears. And He will glorify Me. Doesn't that all point us to this one real truth? And that is life in the Spirit is always a life directed toward Jesus. Life in the Spirit is always pointing us to Jesus. It's always showing us His goodness and His mercy. It's always reminding us of His character. But here's the other part. If it's leading us to Jesus, doesn't that mean it has to be directing us away from something? Right? They, they didn't get Egypt as the promised land. They had to be led out of Egypt so that Egypt could get led out of them so that they could eventually get to the promised land. So coming to Jesus is also coming away from something else. Most of the time we think of the world, but often he's just trying to get us away from our flesh. Most of the work is getting us away from ourselves. We can't stay the same and be new creations. We can't be born again and still live the same old lives. We can't walk in the Spirit and live in the flesh. And so Galatians 5.16 says, For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. There is a battle always going on inside of us. If you are in Christ, the Holy Spirit is in you and He is fighting your flesh. But at the same time, your flesh is fighting the Holy Spirit. Gerald Peterman wrote, the believer must take sides on a daily basis. Each day, we must wake up and commit again to live in the Spirit and yield to His fight against our flesh. But then we have to be honest with ourselves. Most of the time, we just want to give in to the flesh, right? Because the flesh always seems easier. Always seems easier. Always seems more fair. Always see, you know, th that's where we get all these things. It's not fair. Why do I have to do this? Does, why me? Why do they have what they need and I don't seem to have what I need? It just seems easier to give in to the flesh. I, there's a lot of days I just want to be lazy or I want to be angry or I want my way even if I have to use guilt or manipulation to get my way. A lot of days, you and me are the same. We want others to look out for us, but we're not all that interested in looking out for others. We want to be heard. We want to be seen. We want to be admired. Most of us on some level for something want to be applauded. But look at the end of the verse. Look at why the spirit and the flesh are in a battle. First of all, it's because they oppose each other. This should be kind of heavy for us. Everything my flesh wants, the Spirit opposes. Everything that my flesh says, I want this for myself, the Spirit is saying, I don't want that for you. But then everything that the Spirit desires, my flesh seems to fight against. But here's the big purpose of the battle, it says, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. 
So the battle is so we don't get our way. Because our way will never lead to what God desires for us. No wonder it's a battle. Because I'm pretty stubborn. And I want my way most of the time. And so there's this constant battle going on in my mind and in my heart and in my flesh. Which means it's going on in my marriage and in my relationships. And in my understanding of God. And in my desire for God. And in all this stuff there's this battle that's going on. And Paul says it's so that to keep you from doing the thing you want to do. Man, doesn't that make not my will but yours be done like so much bigger? I thought there were at least parts of my will that were good. I thought there were at least parts of me that had to be okay, that God was like, that's a great idea, A.B. You should run with that one. And yet what Paul is saying is, there's Paul is basically rephrasing what Jesus said in John chapter 6, verse 63. The flesh profits nothing at all it is of no use and so now there's this battle going in us on in us not just to get the flesh out of the way but to keep us from doing the things we always wanted to do because we didn't even know it was the flesh so let me ask this and hopefully it won't be confusing what if the biggest obstacle to getting what we want what we want what we want out of life is the Holy Spirit. What if he's the one that's been in the way all this time? I always thought it was this or that or, you know, somebody was blocking me or the enemy was attacking me. What if the reality is it's the Holy Spirit in the way of what I want because what I want is not what God desires for me? it would be much easier if we could just blame Satan. But the truth is, he's roaming around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, and he's defeated. So what if it's God that's keeping us from getting our way because our way has been formed more by our flesh than by his spirit? If God's thoughts and his ways are higher than ours, then his desires have to be different than ours, right? We have to honestly ask ourselves if our desires are more formed by our flesh or by His Spirit. Did our dreams come from our own expectations, from the world around us, from the family we grew up in, or were these dreams born by the Holy Spirit when He came to live in us? I often ask people when they say, you know, I always thought it would be this way. I'd be like, when did that thought start? Did that thought start before you were in Christ or after you were in Christ? Because we have to weigh these things out, whether this is just what I always wanted for me versus what he has breathed into me. In Matthew chapter 16, Peter, by the work of the Holy Spirit, declared that Jesus was the Messiah. When Jesus said, who do you say that I am? Peter stepped up boldly and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. But then shortly after, and we don't know the timing, but it's the next thing that Matthew wrote. When Jesus said that he would suffer and die, Peter pulled him aside, rebuked him, and said, this shall never happen to you. And we get stuck at the beginning. Jesus responds and says, get thee behind me, Satan. And we get stuck right there. Because we don't ever want to hear that. And we're not even sure if it's appropriate, right? Like I've said this before, we're not saying that to anybody. Hopefully you're not saying that to anybody. If you are, please stop. But the explanation is where all the meat is. Jesus says, for you are not setting your mind on things of God, but on the things of man. Where are our minds? Peter's knowledge of Jesus' identity had been the work of the Holy Spirit, but his desire for Jesus' life, his desire for what he wanted Jesus to do in his own life was all the work of the flesh. And so we see the spirit in the flesh at war in Peter and at war in us. And we have to take sides daily. But even more, we must yield to the spirit continually. And as we're yielding to the spirit, we have to understand that a large part of this is rejecting the flesh. Romans chapter 13 verse 14 says, put, the, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the desires of the flesh. So what does make no provision for the desires of the flesh mean? 
The literal translation means don't give your flesh care, don't attend to it, don't supply or nourish it. I think a lot of the modern translations have done a really good job with getting to the heart of this. The NIV says, don't think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. The New Living Translation says, don't let yourself think about ways to indulge your evil desires. The Holman Christian Standard Bible says, make no plans to satisfy the fleshly desires. And the God's Word Translation says, forget about satisfying the desires of your sinful nature. Now, again, it doesn't say your sinful desires, but the desires of your sinful nature. So this is not saying, don't think about doing sin. It's saying, don't think about the things that you dreamed of and longed for and wanted before the Spirit came to dwell in you. In other words, stop trying to figure out how to get your way. Stop trying to figure out how and when your dreams will come true. Stop trying to figure out how to fulfill your destiny and do the work of believing that God is good and that God is sovereign and that God is faithful and that the Holy Spirit lives in us. Isn't this repeated over and over in the New Testament? Romans 12, 2, be transformed. How? By the renewing of your minds, by what you think about and what you stop thinking about. But it goes even further because there's a reason that we need our, our minds renewed. Because then we will be able to test what is the will of God, the good and perfect will of God. We can't know God's will until we have our minds renewed. Again, back to Matthew 16. You have in mind the things of men. 2 Corinthians 10.5. Take captive every thought into obedience in Christ Jesus. Colossians chapter 3, verse 2. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly or fleshly things. The Holy Spirit lives in us to guide us into all truth. But we have to also start setting aside all the things that have been less than truth that we have wanted for ourselves and held on to, hoping that God would let us bring these things along with us as he leads us in his will. The battle is between the flesh and the spirit, but it's being waged in our minds and it's being waged for the attention and affection of our hearts. What have we given our hearts to and where are our minds set? What do we think about most? What, like, what do we think about most? What, what do we think about most when we're unhappy? Because a lot of us have these things that we've decided that I can't be happy until. Or I can't be happy anymore because. All of those things are telling us Jesus isn't enough. And that always comes from the flesh. That always comes from the sinful nature. What dominates our thinking? What have we given our hearts and our minds to? I said it a few weeks ago. I'll say it again. When our base needs become our dominant desires, we are in the flesh. And what I mean by that is when our deepest longings are for things God promised to provide, we're in our flesh because we're questioning God's provision. We're questioning the goodness of his sovereignty. We read this week in a reading plan, we read Numbers chapter 21, where it records Israel's complaints against God, another set of Israel's complaints against God. The New Living Translation says it this way, Israel says against God, why have you brought us out of Egypt to die here in the wilderness? There is nothing to eat here and nothing to drink, and we hate this horrible manna. Man, every time I read it, it hurts more. Like every time I read it, it, and it's not a hurt of judgment. It's like, oh my gosh, I am them. There are so many things God has given me that I have hated because they weren't what I wanted. There are so many seasons that God has called good and I have called bad because they were longer than I thought they were going to be. There are so many things I've lied about. I've lied about because they didn't match what I wanted them to be. And notice that a lot of times we can read this and say, oh, they were complaining against Moses. Every time they complained against Moses, God said they complained against him. God took the complaints against Moses to his heart because all Moses was was God's representative. Man, if you ever want to know who's winning the battle in your life, the flesh complains, the flesh exaggerates, 
The flesh lies and pouts. It diminishes good things and calls them bad. It attacks and manipulates. The flesh refuses to be joyful because it says it can't be happy unless it gets its way. So if you want to know who's winning, if any of those things are prevalent, flesh has a pretty strong hold. Every part of Israel's complaint, and this is where I really want us to see for a minute, every part of Israel's complaint was a lie. Every single part of it. They came out to the desert to worship. And God's presence dwelled with them. And he taught them how to worship. They came out to be free and he freed them from their slavery. They came out to be the people of God and he, showed Aaron, he told Aaron how to put his name on those people. The generation that was dying there was only dying because of disobedience. Because they didn't trust God, but they fought for their own way. They had food. Manna appeared. So when they said, we have no food, they were lying. Manna appeared six days a week. When they said they didn't have water, every time that they needed water, God provided it. Even if it had to come flowing out of a rock, God provided it. Don't confuse not having what you want with God not providing what you need. Complaints about our situations always turn into accusations against God's character. That's why they're so serious to God, and that's why they have to be so serious to us. And Israel only hated the manna because they weren't getting their way. You think they hated manna on day one? You think that day when they were hungry and manna suddenly appeared, anybody ate it and goes, I hate this stuff. They just got tired of it. They just wanted their way. They got bored. They did. They became weary in the well-doing, which cost them the harvest that God had promised and prepared and even desired to give to them. They were bound by the flesh, and I know some of us are because I know that I am far too often. The Spirit lives in us, but we are often, I'm often living in the flesh. I'm often just choosing my anxiety rather than telling my soul to hope in God. I'm choosing the easy emotions. And the easy emotions are the ones that we say aren't easy, but we just keep clinging to them, right? It's, it's easy to be them. It's hard to overcome them. And so we keep leaning into things like fear and anger and selfishness and pride and want. When Psalm 23, 1 says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It's not a promise. It's a truth being told to myself. The Lord is my shepherd. It's getting to places of lack and saying, but the Lord is my shepherd. I choose not to want. I choose not to pout. I choose not to be angry. I choose not to grab for myself because I know that he is good. And I know that I can trust him. And I may not understand his ways and I'll never understand his timing, but I know his his character, and I choose him. He's my shepherd. It's not about the time. It's not about the stuff changing. It's about me digging my heels in on what I know to be true, and I know he's good, and I know he's sovereign, and I know he's faithful, and I know he's for me, and I know I am his. I'm a child of God, no matter what's going on around me. God loves me no matter what's happening to me. All things work together for good. In all these places, I'm remembering these things and I'm believing these things and I'm rejoicing in, the, rejoicing in these things. That's living in the Spirit because I believe the Spirit is living in me. And all the while, the Spirit is saying, stop looking at the waves, stop looking at the wind, just keep walking on the water. Just keep trusting the one that feeds you. Keep trusting the one who saved you. Keep trusting the one that loves you. But we have to tell ourselves to believe the Spirit. Because I guarantee you're hearing those things, but most of the time we're pushing them aside. Because we're going, when is it going to end? When is it going to be my turn? When is it going to be what I want it to be? What if it's not? I just ask you that tonight. What if it's not? What if it's not going to end? What if it's not going to be your turn? Forgive me, I don't mean to sound judgmental. What if, there's, what if you're not going to get a winning season? What if he's your winning season? What if he's your great reward? What if he is your abundance? What if he is the overflow, the too much, the too good to be thankful for? What if it's him 
because it has to be him because he's better than everything else. Everything that Jesus promised the Holy Spirit would do would point us to Jesus. But everything the flesh does points us to ourselves. And here's the thing. We don't have to ask for the Holy Spirit to lead us. He's always doing his job. We have to ask to follow. Right? I've been catching myself praying lately, and every time I say, lead me, Holy Spirit, I've been catching myself saying, well, he's doing that. He's, Jesus promised he would. I don't have to ask God to do his God stuff. I have to ask God to teach me how to follow, yield, trust, believe, obey. It might be time to set some things down. It might be time to put some things aside. It might be time to stop making room for and dreaming about things that are robbing God of our affection and robbing us of the joy of learning how to trust in God's goodness in difficulty. Hebrews chapter 3 says the only reason that the first generation of Israelites that left Egypt didn't go into the promised land was their unbelief. Unbelief always ends in one thing, an accusation of God not doing what he promised to do. Don't fall for the lies. Don't fall into the ease of complaining. Trust God. But the Spirit, He gives life. He leads into all truth. He reminds us of the words of Jesus. He sheds the love of God abroad in our hearts. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us always, even to the end of the age. But the Holy Spirit is God in us. And by living in us, he is producing his character. He's producing God's character in us. Paul wrote in our passage tonight that the works of the flesh are evident, but the fruit of the Spirit are even more evident. They're even more vivid and more clear. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The thoughts that we are entertaining, are they filled with and producing those fruits in our lives? The things I'm talking about, the things I'm saying, the way I'm describing my life, do they sound like they're filled with these fruits? Or do they sound a whole lot more like the jealousy and the impatience and the envy and the divisiveness of the flesh? Are the voices we're listening to and the dreams we're dreaming or the goals we're clinging to, the desires that dominate our lives, are they from God? Or are they filled with the fruit of the Spirit. So tonight, the Spirit is leading. Are we following? Are we the obstacle to the work of God in our lives? Is the flesh getting more of our attention and affection than the Holy Spirit? Are our mindsets, opinions, attitudes, and actions more defined by the flesh or by the Spirit? Are we bearing the fruit of God's character? Do we even realize that we're in a war? Do we even realize that there's a battle going on within us? We talked, sometimes we get so caught up in like what we call spiritual warfare and what's going on around us that we miss that the real battle's in us. Right? Like, God's handling that. That's his domain. My domain is here. Is my heart being transformed? Am I yielding to the Holy Spirit? James 4 begins with a description of living in the flesh. It describes living in the flesh this way. Quarrels, division, selfishness, manipulation, ulterior motives. But then verse 5 says this. God is passionate that the spirit he has placed within us should be faithful to him. And that's not the Holy Spirit. This is now our spirit in James chapter 4 verse 5. The desire of God's heart is that we would be faithful to him. That we would choose Him. That we would trust, believe, and love Him. That we would walk by faith and not by sight. That we would walk in the Spirit and make no room for the flesh. That we would, as James puts it, do this. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your heart, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Will we submit ourselves to God tonight? And I, I mean, like, totally different. Will Not will we submit our situation, or will we submit our circumstances, or our problems, but will we submit ourselves? 
our, the fabric of who we are, our hearts, our lives, the places where we've been fighting against conviction rather than letting conviction have its way in us? Are we willing to submit who we actually are to God? Will we repent of living in the flesh more than we live in the spirit? Will we confess our complaining, our worrying, our selfish and stubborn desires and demands and declare God's goodness and God's faithfulness to our hearts? Are we willing to draw near to God, believing that he will draw near to us? And to ask him to have his way and finally put our way down. Tonight, are we willing to pray, Lord, lead me, Holy Spirit. Lead me in your will for my life. Forgive me for opposing you. Teach me to trust you. Teach me to believe and to obey and to follow. But here's what I'm going to ask us to do tonight. Again, uncomfortable as it may be. I want to ask us to act on this. But not the way that you may expect. Tonight, I'm going to challenge all of us before we leave this room, not even outside, before we leave this room, go and tell someone something good that God has done for you. See, in Numbers chapter 21, when Israel was complaining, someone could have stood up and said, hey, I'm a little tired of the manna too. But remember when he brought us through the sea? And remember how we heard his voice at Sinai? Remember how the first time we ran out of water, Moses struck a rock and water came out, and not just a little bit, but enough water to, to drink for all of us million plus people and all of our animals to drink? Did you ever think about that? Like the, 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 uh, the Sunday school picture is like a little trickle of water coming out of a rock. There were more than a million people, and they had animals. So when water came out of a rock, it was like a river. It was like God created a river so that they would know, when you think you lack, I abound. When you think something's missing, I have more than you need. When you learn to trust me, you will believe that everything is under my control. What if somebody would have just stood up and said, remember when we finally set up the tabernacle the first time and the cloud of God's presence was so thick that the priest couldn't go, even go inside? Remember how when we were in Egypt and we were under a heavy burden and we were crying out to God and suddenly we found out through Moses that he heard us and that he had come down to rescue us? And I really believe this, that when complaining happens, if we would discuss God's goodness... It will shrink our complaints and remind us, not that we have it good, but that we have a good God. I'm not trying to say that your trouble isn't real, that your problems aren't big, that life isn't hard. I'm not saying any of that. What I am saying is God is good. You're in his hands. He will not fail you. He has heard you. He knows you. And he's making you and doing in you what he desires for you. But at some point, somebody has to step into our lives and stir up good works by saying, I understand it's hard. Lord, but don't forget what God has done. And sometimes we do that by telling somebody else, here's what God has done for me. Here's where I have seen his goodness. Here's what he has shown me about himself. And so tonight, let's close. Let's close by going and finding each other and telling one another the stories of what God has done. Let's drown out the complaints with the stories of his goodness. Because there's plenty of them. There's plenty of them. We've all got a story. In fact, we've all got a story from this week. If we let the complaints fall back and we start saying, you know what? God was really good. God was there. God was for me. God was speaking to me. Grab hold of those places. But then I'm going to take this challenge a little bit further. Don't leave this room tonight until you tell somebody something good that God has done. But then, let's do it all week. Invite somebody to your table. Make a phone call. Send a text. Have a voice time. Make a conscious effort to sit down with somebody, not for a cup of coffee, not for a cup of tea, but to discuss the goodness of God in the land of the living. Have your coffee. Have your tea. But make it intentional that I am not going to give complaining a room in my life or in your life. I'm not going to make room for the flesh any longer. I'm going to sit down and discuss what I know to be true. God is good. 
because all we do is forget. Right? It's not that God does, stops being good. It's that we forget. And he's so generous. He's so kind that he says, I know you're forgetful. So I'm going to have my spirit breathe out his word. And then I'm going to have my spirit come dwell within you. And then I'm going to surround you with my people. And then if that doesn't work, look up. And the stars and the planets will declare my wonder and my goodness. It takes a lot of work to keep complaining. If we worked at ha as hard at declaring the goodness of God as we do as at complaining when things don't go our way, the gospel would have already reached every corner and Jesus could come. And so tonight, I know it makes you uncomfortable. I know some of you are new. You don't know anybody. This is what better way to introduce yourself than to say, can I just tell you one real quick thing that God has done for me? Would you bow your heads with me? Father, I thank you. I thank you that your spirit lives in us. The more we read about it, the more we talk about it, the more overwhelmed I am and the less I feel like I know. Because it's amazing. The spirit who hovered over the chaos of the waters doesn't just hover over the chaos of my life. He came to live in me so he could set me at peace. To glorify Jesus. To lead me in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. And so tonight, God, I pray that your spirit is convicting all of us. I pray that your word is convicting all of us. And I pray that, pray that you've made us aware of places where we, have been, where we have been in the flesh. Where we have given in to complaints. Where we have given in to manipulation. Where we've given in to just doing things our way and demanding things be our way. And I pray that we would not be condemned but convicted. And I pray that that conviction would simply drive us to remember that you are good and to share your goodness with each other. And so tonight, God, I pray for all of my friends in the room. I pray for my friends that might be watching. Those that are watching, go find somebody somewhere. Send a text. Send me a text if you want. And I pray that you give us the courage to come out of our flesh and walk in the Spirit by declaring the goodness of God. Lord, fill our hearts, fill our minds, fill our mouths so that we can live by the Spirit who already lives in us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Would you stand with me real briefly? I just want to give you a benediction and then we will go. And then, no, you can't go. Then you'll go talk to people and then you can leave. If only those doors had locks, right? Tonight I just want to use a familiar butch brought us there. We, I just want to use Psalm 34. The first three verses as our benediction. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes it bo my, its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. And then let's act this out. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. God bless you guys. Thank you.